I'm really excited and honored to be here um, to uh, help host our guest, Lobsang. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about Lobsang and why she's here from, from Marta Kern in just a moment. But um, this, this opportunity to hear from Lobsang, um, I, I like to say it's, it's kind of a parting gift from our, our old colleague and friend, um, Heather Lazarus. And um, Marta and I were at a, a little gathering to celebrate her life. Um, for those who don't know, Heather passed away recently. And Heather was the founder of, um, co-founder of Rising Voices, which is the NCAR um, hosted effort to bring together Western science and indigenous science or knowledge systems. Um, and so she's left quite a legacy. And this, this talk is a small parting gift from Heather because Marta and I were there and we bumped into each other and Marta said, well, I've got this great person coming and, and you know, we, we, we should do something. And so, so that's where this came from and it kind of came together very last minute, so we apologize for that. Um, but I'm very excited because I think um, Lob Song's work is at the intersection and, and it's a RAL hosted seminar, of course, it's open to the entire NCAR community and others beyond, but um, you know, in RAL, you know, we're the research applications lab, and I think we're going to hear about some of the practical aspects in a very sensitive region uh, to climate change and water resource issues, which is near and dear to many. And many of our colleagues here actually work in the region. So anyways, with that brief introduction, I'd like to hand the podium to Marta Kern. Um, and if you've got questions, use the Slido or... Um, and, and so we'll hold questions to the end. I think Lob Song was thinking of talking for maybe 30 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. I did want to say one more thing. I almost forgot. So um, Lob Song will be around for a little while afterwards. So we'll probably just stay in this room, and you can chat some more with Lob Song if you've got more questions. One, Lob Song gave us eight abstracts. I think it was eight. Um, <laughs> that we could have picked from. And they were all so marvelous. Um, it was almost impossible to pick. But we settled on this one, uh, climate change and water security in the Tibetan Plateau. But there are many different dimensions to this. And she'd be more than happy to talk to us. And at around noon, we're going to convene for a group lunch in the cafeteria. So if you're not free from 11, please feel free to come find us in the cafeteria. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. And I just want to say how what an honor it is to be here and also to sort of thank other folks who are not here. But um, we have an organization, Eco Arts Connections, which brings the arts together with science and social justice and indigenous and other ways of knowing to inspire people to live more sustainably. And I just want to give a shout out to um, NCAR, UCAR employees, Linda Carbone, Lisa Gardner, and uh, now Becca Hathaway, because we've been able to do exhibits uh, in the Mesa Lab as art science collaborative um, entities. And that will be the end of my bragging here. Now I just want to talk about Lofsang, who I had the great good fortune to meet in Glasgow at the UN Climate Conference. Um, and I'm just going to read excerpts from, she has a hugely long CV. <laughs> I'm just going to read snippets here. Um, she's an environment researcher for the International Tibet Network in Dharamsala, which many of you may know from your research, but it's also the place where the Dalai Lama lives. Uh, she holds a PhD degree in Chinese studies from the Center for Asian Studies at JNU, which I've already forgotten what it stands for, but it's uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. I think that's sort of close. She has also worked as a research associate as the Center for China Analysis and Strategy. Um, she's published articles. She's one of those people. She's published articles in various journals, like a gazillion. Um, she's also participated in and presented at um, papers at various international conferences around the world. And her research focuses on climate change in Tibet, China's environmental policies toward Tibet, climate change on the Brahmaputra River, and China and Tibet relations. She's a strong advocate and campaigner for the protection of human rights of the Tibetan people. Um, and this whole visit, this week-long visit, um, has came together very quickly. I casually said in Glasgow, when I heard her speak, I said, oh my god, you should come to Boulder. There's, it's supposedly, I don't know if this is true, is this an, is, has the highest density of climate researchers in the world. I don't know if that's true anymore, but 
That's something I heard. <laughs> and um, I read, actually, I read. Um, and, um, but also, and there's a, a great center for Tibetan Buddhism and interest in it here. And so in January, she said, hey, I'm coming to the UN Water Conference, and could I come to Boulder? And I said, sure. And Tim and I were talking about the fake it till you make it just recently. So that was, sure. <laughs> and, but amazingly, um, we were able to put together, thanks to everybody collaborating, a week of talks at Nairobi University, here, at NOAA, at um, various places in CU. And the her whole week is sponsored can't forget these wonderful humans. Um, our organization, Eco Arts Connections, but the Environmental Studies Program at CU, INSTAR, the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research, uh, the Tibet Ham Himalaya Institute, also at CU, and then various individuals. And so I just want to, I just have to, I always, every time I look at Lo Sang, I go, oh, I'm so grateful that you're here. Because every time I hear her speak, I learn more things. So I really hope you join us uh, in the conversation afterward and also at lunch if you can. And especially Tim, thank you so much. <laughs> Lo Sang. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, so uh, before before I talk about uh, talk on our uh, uh, topic, uh, I would like to share that uh, uh, this uh, climate change issue in Tibet is a really really crucial issue. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, um, present day uh, real situation, uh, is that um, you know those Tibetans who were who, who live in uh, Tibet, uh, but then for them to come out and then speak uh, uh, anything against the policy is really, really difficult. But those who Tibetans who live uh, uh, outside Tibet, uh, so for us to get access and then to go inside uh, Tibet and do a field trip and do uh, you know proper research is, uh, I, 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 uh, I could say almost like impossible. Uh, but for me, um, I was uh, born in Tibet. Uh, and then in 1991, uh, I crossed, uh, when, when I was like almost um, eight, nine, 10 years. Uh, so I crossed Himalaya with my mom and my brother. And then I was uh, left uh, in Tibetan schools and my brother became a monk. And then my mom went back and uh, then from uh, then, uh, after 1991, only in 2016, uh, I could go back uh, to Tibet to uh, visit my family. But then during that time, uh, I was doing my PhD. And uh, uh, so it was, I went to visit a family. It's like a family uh, uh, kind of a uni unification with the family. So I was uh, not allowed to do any formal um, uh, study or uh, interview with the Tibetans in, in Tibet, but then I tried my best to, you know, have a uh, keep observation and try to interact with only only very close family members who who I trust. So this is the uh, so and after that uh, I, I I couldn't go back to Tibet for so so most of my research is either based on secondary sources or uh, interviewing in the Tibetans who come recently uh, from, from Tibet to India, and then uh, uh, the, uh, the English or the Tibetan, uh, uh, you know, sources uh, from, from from Tibet. And uh, so, uh, before we uh, go on the subject, uh, I, I I thought that uh, you know, let me uh, let me share a brief introduction on the uh, Tibetan plateau that we, we call. Uh, so uh, Tibetan plateau uh, is uh, also known as a uh, roof of the world, uh, where it is situated uh, at the um, heart of Asia, where it lies on the north of India, and then Nepal, Bhutan, and Burma, and also the west of, west of China. And uh, so the average, uh, you know, height of the Tibetan plateau is between 4,000 to 4,500 uh, meters above the sea level. Uh, and uh, Tibetan plateau is also the largest and the highest uh, plateau in the in the world, uh, where it has a total um, 
uh, land of 2.5 million square kilometer, uh, which is close to 2% of the, uh, the land uh, surface of the planet. Uh, and uh, Tibetan Plateau also makes uh, almost like 23% of the uh, China's total land, but it has only, uh, I could say, maybe 1% of China's total, total population. And so to, uh, Tibetan Plateau is also surrounded by Himalayas in the south and Kulun and, uh, Kulun and Hindu Kush uh, mountain uh, in, the, in the west and in the north, north as well. And so here, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, um, the whole map uh, is the traditional Tibetan uh, you know, uh, area where uh, for, for the Tibet, uh, we, we call this as a Tibet. This whole part is a Tibet. And uh, then uh, traditionally we have three provinces, the Uzang, Amdo, and Kham, Kham region. And uh, then uh, the Chinese government, they introduced uh, Tibet Autonomous Region in 1965. And for Chinese government, when they say Tibet, they only mean this part of the area where they call Tibet Autonomous Region. And uh, so this uh, Tibet Autonomous Region was uh, created uh, in 1965. And so, which comprises of the, uh, like, uh, the uh, central of the Uzang, Uzang region and the western part of the Kham region. And I was born over here, so my uh, hometown is uh, not included in Tibet. So it comes under the Chinese province of Sichuan province. Uh, uh, whereas the His Holiness uh, uh, born, he uh, comes in the Qinghai province of uh, China. And uh, so, the, but then right now, the Tibet uh, Autonomous Region is almost like a home of only, um, you know, three, three million Tibetan, where we believe right now in, in Tibet, the whole Tibetan area, there are around like six million Tibetans who, who live over there. And uh, so that is the rough introduction of the whole, when, when I say Tibet, I mean the old three provinces of Tibet. Uh, yeah, and so and then uh, Tibet is also known as the third pole, um, where where because it holds the largest uh, ice mass uh, on the planet outside the North and the South Pole, and uh, it is also called as the Water Tower of Asia, uh, because it becomes the source of many of the Asia's uh, principal rivers, uh, such as Brahmaputra. And the Tibetan name for Brahmaputra is Yalung Tsangbo. The Indus River, uh, which we call Senge Kapap, the Satlash Langche Kapap, Salwen, uh, Gyalmongonchu, and the Mekong and Yangtze Yalo, Yalo River as well. So, well, uh, well uh, so these rivers become also very important for the uh, people who live on the downstream nations, where the, um, it, it's uh, the places of the world's most uh, populous nations like India, China, uh, and then uh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and then whole uh, Mekong um, region, Burma, Laos, Tha Tha uh, Thailand, and uh, Cambodia as well. So uh, we say that almost 1.3 Asian populations are dependent on the water that flows uh, from, from, from Tibet. Uh, and But then uh, right now, uh, Tibet has a huge uh, uh, is uh, facing climate change, and but then pace of climate change on the Tibetan plateau is uh, uh, still uh, very. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's uh, uncertain. But then there is a consensus among the climate scientists that there is a shift in temperature rise, and then the desertification is another big, big uh, uh, problem uh, in in Tibet, and then glacier melting which also strikes Asia as much as the rest of the world. And uh, with, in, in terms of temperature rise, we believe that uh, almost 2 to 3 percent, the Tibet is warming, 2 to 3 percent uh, much faster than the rest, rest of the world. So uh, it's a, the, the, the temperature rise is a huge problem. And because of the climate change, then we also see uh, with this also a glacier lake outburst floods as well, and then be, and because of this, then we we have uh, its, its impact on uh, uh, you know social economic condition and uh, uh, it's uh, the Tibet, the whole Tibet plateau also plays a very significant role uh, in maintaining the ecological uh, security of uh, China and then its neighboring country as as well. Uh, 
And then uh, because of the, you know, uh, the, the change in temperature, uh, it leads to ecological uh, uh, degradation and then also shortage of water resources. But then uh, uh, with, with Tibet, uh, I could also say that uh, not just the climate change, but because of the, uh, the many factors, uh, you know, uh, because of the human, uh, you know, factors, the human activities in terms of uh, rapid urbanization and uh, rapid uh, um, infrastructure development that also uh, gives lots of impact on the Tibetan plateau as well. And so here is the, um, I mean, uh, the major effect is that because at, we believe that almost like six to 45 uh, percent of the rivers that flow uh, uh, in the Tibetan plateau are dependent on the glaciers, a glacier, glacier melt, and then it uh, um, increases almost to 70% in summer, uh, summer as well. And uh, then uh, the IPCC also, um, the, uh, they highlight predicting by saying that Himalaya glaciers will lose around uh, three quarters of their mass by um, uh, 2100. And then these glaciers are melting really fast, fast in uh, um, no, Tibetan Plateau, which will have an impact on almost like 1.3 or 1.4 uh, Asian population uh, as well. And then that will also have uh, lots of uh, disruption on water security. And uh, then, you know, and at the same time, uh, in the, on the Tibetan Plateau, there is also an issue, as I said earlier, urbanization and then uh, rapid, uh, you know, the population rises, another big, big problem on on the uh, Tibetan Plateau as well. And then, um, uh, so uh, the Glacier Lake uh, outburst is another another um, uh, ma major problem that uh, we face in Tibet as well. But uh, I would like to also confess by saying that uh, my background is not really hardcore science. Uh, so I did my uh, like major in international relations. So I uh, uh, tend to look more on government policies and how climate change is impact on uh, you know uh, humans and uh, uh, their livelihood and also so social ecological impact uh, uh, because of the climate change so and uh, then permafrost Tibet has a huge permafrost way it says that uh, the permafrost covers almost like 1.3 to 1.6 million uh, uh, you know, squ uh, square kilometer and because of the temperature rise the permafrost are also melting uh, rapidly on the on the Tibetan plateau and um, uh, the the government has uh, uh, built uh, lots of uh, especially the railway projects uh, uh, in on on the whole Tibet plateau and the first Lhasa Kolmo railway uh, was built on 2006 and then there were like many studies saying that all the railway infrastructure uh, are mostly are built on the permafrost that also leads to you know, rapid melting of the permafrost um, as well. And then when we focus on the water, water crisis, I think it's it's really uh, important to look uh, because at the major, uh, the issues that we face in China also has an impact on Tibetan plateau. And uh, one is that because of the water crisis in, in, in China and water pollution is uh, uh, one of uh, like major serious environment uh, threats in, in China as well. Whereas 75% of the urban uh, water in China is inappropriate, inappropriate for drinking and 30% uh, unfit for use in agriculture and industry as well. Uh, but then northern China has almost like 45% uh, of the country's uh, total, po total population, northern China has, but then it has uh, 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 only like 13.8% uh, of the freshwater resources. So that makes the China to depend the water from, from Tibet. And because of that, there are many policies introduced by the government in terms uh, of uh, you know, various policies uh, to, to support the uh, people on the northern, uh, northern China. And then uh, China's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, um, it's a rapid uh, economic growth and urbanization industry, industrialization, uh, you know, uh, leads to inadequate uh, investment in uh, water supply and also treatment uh, uh, and that has le led to uh, a major water, uh, water pollution in China. 
So, but then China has, when we say that uh, earlier, when I mentioned earlier about Tibet being the source of Asia's water, so that has really put lots of advantage uh, on, the, on the Chinese government because uh, since uh, uh, Tibet becomes the source of the uh, water um, tower, and then uh, China has lies with uh, 19 international, sorry, uh, 19 uh, in, um, international uh, um, river basins. But then uh, officially, China has not signed any of the river treaty with any of the downstream nations because you are on the advantage of on the upstream. And so you don't have to depend on the down, down, downstream nation. And so that is uh, so the transparent nature of the rivers on uh, in Tibet has a huge favorable in, in terms of China to make a dam construction. And uh, so, uh, so that's, that's a one uh, issue that, uh, and because of that, um, China continues to build almost uh, like old dams in all the rivers. And Brahmaputra has been, we believe that Brahmaputra has been the last river that has been dammed. Uh, but then um, the, the first dam that China built on uh, the um, upstream of the uh, Yalung Tsangbor Brahmaputra on Tibet plateau was in, uh, I think, 2010, uh, the Zamu Dam. Whereas uh, the officially Chinese government uh, announced that they have uh, plans to build three more dams on the Brahmaputra, but they are uh, hydrologists or the scientists or the researchers say that uh, it's not uh, uh, three dams, but then Chinese government has uh, uh, plans to build 11 more dams on the upstream of the Brahmaputra. At the same time, Indian government is also, you know, in a competition to build uh, dams, saying that because uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, a study or uh, lots of, uh, you know, analysis saying that uh, China might have also policy to divert the Brahmaputra on the upward and then uh, so the Indian government says that, okay, so if China does that, we need to build a reservoir. So when there is no water, we can you know, save and uh, we can restore and then release. When there is too much water coming from uh, the Tibet site, then uh, you know, we can also uh, you know, control. So there is, a, it's like a both, both the sites are in a huge competition, not really uh, take, uh, I mean, um, give consideration of the whole uh, sensitivity of, of the whole ecological and then um, the local people are uh, both from the India side and the China side, local people are not consulted in whole policy, policy making. And, but then uh, when, we, when we look about, um, look on water uh, resources, uh, mining is also major, major problem uh, in, in Tibet as well, because uh, mining is one of the major, uh, Beijing's uh, four pillar industries in the Tibet uh, autonomous region, the, East, uh, the Eastern Tibet. And then because of the Chinese, uh, the rapid economic development and industrialization, uh, it demands vast uh, mineral resources and then investing a huge amount of money in mining, mining indus, uh, uh, you know, industry in, in, in Tibet, and then which leads to a water, water uh, um, pollution and then destabilizing the whole fragile uh, mountain slope at the same time, uh, you know, leading to degradation on the uh, pasture and uh, pasture and also soil soil erosion then you know, uh, because of the mining, uh, contamination of water, air pollution, and water uh, noise pollution are the major problem uh, because of that. And uh, so when we look uh, on the uh, mining, mining side, uh, so Tibet has a huge miner mineral resources, and uh, uh, the Chinese name for Tibet is uh, 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 Xizang, or uh, so, and then, uh, you know, and uh, it is also, uh, you know, meaning of way, way saying that, you know, I mean, Tibet is also known uh, or uh, in terms of calling the Tibet uh, as a Western treasure land, treasure in, in terms of mining. So, the, in, uh, so I mean, the oil and gas, uh, copper, gold, and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, so the mineral resources are in major uh, parts of, of the, Tibet's plateau, and uh, then because of the mining, when we look at the mining, so the major rivers are also located in that area, so it has a huge impact on the um, uh, rivers as well. And then uh, because of the mining, it leads to 
uh, pollute the river. And so this is a photo in uh, 2016, and, uh, uh, and uh, the Tibetans from my hometown, uh, we call it Kanze, the Eastern Tibet. So they protested uh, against the environment damage caused by the mining operation um, you know, carried out uh, on our locality. And because of the uh, mining, uh, you know, uh, it has uh, leaked uh, chemicals and then led to water pollution and killed many animals, um, the cows and fishes as well. So, so this is a picture where, you know, local people come out and uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, expressing their grievances because of the, you know, the mining and how it impacts on their their livelihood at, at the same time. So uh, today, if you look at, in 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 terms of uh, the kind of mining protests or uh, or the um, environment related protests, anti mining protests are the major protests that we see in in Tibet. Uh, and uh, as uh, you might be also aware that uh, since two thousand nine. Um, more than, I think, uh, more than 150 Tibetans have uh, burnt themselves. We call it self-immolation to uh, protest against the government, right? So the situation is that when you don't have a space to share your grievances or your anger, then the only, uh, the last solution is to kill yourself or to burn yourself so that, you know, you let the state know that, you know, the policy. We are not happy with the policy, and there are also cases of where uh, Tibetan self immolators they self immolate um, uh, in front of the mine mine site. So that or this also shows shows that. And but then uh, problem is that um, uh, <clears throat> all these protests are uh, there is like not a unified uh, environment group or you know uh, I mean solidarity. Uh, among all these places because um, <clears throat> there is uh, not a very independent environment NGO who can coordinate because uh, when as soon as you protest, then there is a possibility that you might uh, not be able to afford or uh, have a you know, good lawyer uh, to represent you. And then uh, local people are sometimes, uh, you know, they end up in jail. So it's a really, really difficult uh, um, I would say process uh, or, or a movement that they lead. But then mining uh, is considered very sensitive and uh, very, very sensitive for the government. But they are also local uh, environment, <clears throat> environment NGOs or, or environment defenders who do uh, uh, environment work in terms of waste management, which is considered very less sensitive. Uh, and then uh, they do lots of environment education for the local communities, which I think uh, they, to a certain ex extent, they get a space and support from the state government as, as well. Excuse. So, um, <clears throat> so in 2016, uh, when I went back um, to visit my family, uh, so this is a... Uh, um, river that this is just uh, in front of my village. And so when I was in Tibet, uh, I, uh, I remember very, very clearly that we, we could uh, drink this, uh, this uh, river. And I, I remember where, uh, me being a kid, when the, uh, the small stream, when it flows, uh, the kids, you know, we can just lie down and then, you know, we will drink like that. But when, <coughs> when I went in 2016, this river is, uh, uh, people don't consume uh, this is, river is no longer drinkable at all and plus uh, lots of lots of pollution happening and lots of uh, uh, I mean <clears throat> water pollution everywhere because uh, in in big cities in Tibetan area the waste management is really really good but uh, the problem lies on the village areas where there is no waste management at all so there are only two options available for the local people on a village, either you throw the garbage in a river or you burn or you, or, or, or you have uh, create your own landfill and throw the garbage. And uh, so since there is a lack of, uh, you know, waste management in a rural, rural area, this is my hometown in Tibet. So rural area, then, you know, I'm, I could see, you know, the plastic waste every, everywhere. And it's so disheartening to see because um, there is no, uh, 
Sometimes, you know, big companies are problematic, but sometimes I wish that, you know, some company, if they could come to a village and then do, you know, have uh, invest money in terms of recycling or waste management. But uh, when I went over there, it's uh, not visible in a rural area. And this is major problem that I feel that, you know, where both the civil society or the private companies or the state, they should come and really handle and uh, or uh, work on waste management as well. And then in terms of water um, policy, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the Chinese government has a, north, a south north water transfer project to bear because the north faced a lot of problem. Then they are diverting the water from the south to the to the north, and so uh, in, when it comes to Brahmaputra, uh, people believe that maybe there is a possibility that Brahmaputra can also, you know, uh, get diverted on the uh, north. Uh, but then um, the state government uh, rejects uh, this uh, this theory that uh, the Chinese government. But then uh, there are um, uh, many research uh, and people do raise. Uh, um, big concern of that. <clears throat> so if if um, government does, then it will have a lot of impact on downstream nation when, when it comes to Brahmaputra, especially India, Bangladesh. Uh, but then when it, since I said earlier, when there is no water convention uh, or a water treaty, and uh, both India and China has not signed UN water convention, um, so there is a not there is not a, the no river basin organization when where they can come and you know discuss on on that and <coughs> sorry <laughs> and when we look on um, Mekong and Brahmaputra as well states are continue uh, and they are in the process of a competition in terms of dam construction every everywhere and and it's so disheartening to to, to see that the Chinese are Chinese have lots of dam construction, but the Chinese government has uh, not joined the Mekong River Commission, and uh, there is no um, river basin organization on Brahmaputra as well. But then, in a long time, when you think think about that, it will have a huge impact on livelihood of the of of, of the people. And uh, but then uh, the another challenge that I I face is that since I am I live outside. Uh, uh, Tibet. So to 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 have uh, access uh, is is uh, really really uh, diff difficult uh, right now. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, it's very important to have uh, you know a, a transparency management framework, and then transparency is another uh, big issue in terms of dam, dam construction. Um, the one from the upstream, you know, they don't share information and. Uh, um, in, in terms of Brahmaputra, they have only, with India and China, they have only expert level mechanism. And uh, during the monsoon uh, time, um, China shares some data to Indian government. But then, as we all are aware, uh, there is a lot of border conflict between India and China. So whenever there is a border dispute between India and China, the Chinese government, they don't share the uh, water flow data. and. Uh, so this this is this is a really um, big problem right now. And when there is a, a bilateral dialogue between India and China, uh, environment or, or or water is not their major major focus, or uh, so it doesn't receive much uh, um, you know attention. And uh, people from Assam, you know, they really uh, raise their voices against the Indian government and against the Chinese government, saying that we don't need a dam on our uh, land because that will have a huge impact on our livelihood. But then uh, the voices, you know, I feel like uh, it's only at the national level. It doesn't receive much attention from Beijing or from New Delhi <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the same time. So, And then another big issue that I would like to say is that uh, inclusion of Tibetans in the local people in the decision making. Because uh, in, in Tibet, uh, Tibetan people are not uh, included in the decision making mm, processes. When we look at the environment organizations or institutions, all the top officials are the Chinese. And then at the local are um, you know at a very lower position. And when I went to home to my hometown, my brother said that he is a part of a, a village level environment protection group. And I said that what is your role? I said we don't have any role, but we just uh, every year we we receive some some um, uh, 
kind of a you know salary or income from the government. Uh, so then, uh, then, uh, but then the thing is that uh, in in this uh, situation, people, uh, when you look from outside, if you feel like you know people are included in the uh, like whole environment protection work. But then it's just for the namesake. You create an institution. You don't know what's their role, but then you pay them. Since our village is uh, economically not very developed, the thing is that okay, people love to be in that group because they are uh, getting paid without doing anything, mm -hmm. and so that has a political implication as well because um, that is also in a way, from my understanding, is a way of controlling people expressing against uh, or saying anything against the government because if you say anything against the government you fear that okay i might not be uh, become a part of this environment group or i might not get paid so this is a very uh, i think uh, smart or strategic very very cunning way of controlling people's uh, voices by just paying small subsidies and then um People, I think sometimes, you know, they are happy, 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 happy with that. And I believe that sustainable development could be another uh, uh, solu solution if, if, if uh, uh, ever we need a uh, uh, development on the uh, whole uh, Himalaya belt. And my concern right now is uh, the whole Himalaya belt is very, very sensitive in terms of geography. And then it is prone to earthquake and landslides as well. But then right now, what I see is that both India and China are in competition to build lots and lots of infrastructure development on the whole belt because of the whole, both of them wants to claim the land where nobody wants to live in, in this area. Uh, so, um, the, the, the border areas are very, in terms of uh, whether it's very harsh and there are uh, not many people living. So uh, from in, uh, from Chinese side, uh, what they do is they are uh, encouraging local Tibetans to go to the border site and then you live there. So they are creating lots of a border village and uh, then uh, encouraging people saying that you are the savior of whole motherland. So then people feel that, okay, I'm so important. I have to go to the border and live there. And there are so many of border villages are created on the, um, on the Tibet side of uh, the land. Whereas from the Indian side, the similar thing is happening, especially on the Brahmaputra Basin where Tibetans are there. There is no infrastructure development. There is no healthcare facilities. Uh, the, uh, the, the roads, uh, you know, the, the clean, uh, clean access to clean water uh, or healthcare, it's, it's uh, really, really difficult. But then when I went there, there are so many slogans in all over saying that you are the hero, you are the protector, you are the, you know, and but then, you know, people sometimes you know, tend to think that, okay, so my, my role is to, to stay there and protect the land. So this is kind of, a, I think, real situation. And it's a quite, a, I would say, depressing, but then hope that maybe there would be some positive changes in the new, new feature. And I hope that they could have uh, more actions on the ground level and uh, in terms of uh, more information sharing, especially for the in, in terms of adaptation and disaster management and the local level. These trainings and informations are really, really important. But as I said earlier, when a village does, does not have uh, electricity or access to electricity, then the kind of information that we create in social media and all the meetings, all the big meetings are happening in big cities, it doesn't really, uh, I would like to say, it doesn't really go on a place where they are directly facing the environment challenges. Thank you so much. So um, we've got several questions. Um, so we'll start with questions in the room. And I'll probably go east to west. <coughs> um, and then we'll go to questions online if we have some. So um, maybe you could just briefly introduce yourself and ask a question. Roy. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Roy Rasmussen. I'm a senior scientist here in, at NCAR. And I have a question about the. Uh, the uh, fish kill. So you showed the mining activity and got into the water, polluted the water, killed the fish. What about the human impact? Did it 
impact. You said you couldn't drink the water when you went back in 2016. Uh, what, what do you drink? So <clears throat> the human impact of uh, mining is that uh, the kind of protest, as I said earlier, the kind of protest that we, we, we see is, uh, um, you know, I, I, I feel that from the Tibetan uh, perspective, you know, when, I mean, it's, it's all interrelated, uh, related, you know, we, we concept of uh, interdependent. Uh, so when, when animals are killed, definitely uh, it shows that there is an impact on human uh, at the same time. But then people uh, sometimes, you know, they, they, uh, they come out and share the grievances only when it's something very, very visible. And so that's also one. And, uh, but then uh, when, when I was in, in, in uh, Tibet, my hometown, uh, we never used to have uh, tap water. Uh, so uh, we would just, uh, you know, fetch water from the river. But then when I went, uh, so the tap water were, were there in, on the, installed on the houses. So people don't uh, uh, drink, drink the river. Uh, the water that flows in in front of in front of you, you that's uh, one one uh, issue that I like to say. But then I think it would be very interesting uh, the human impact uh, of the mining and uh, water pollution. But uh, uh, I haven't uh, till now not be able to gather uh, like much information on this this. But then um, one uh, the protest or the mining protest I would like to share here is that people sometimes. Uh, uh, protests or come out when the mining is happening on the sacred mountains and when the mining has an impact on the uh, uh, sacred uh, river. Uh, uh, that's, uh, thus, I think we believe that uh, the, the uh, uh, philosophy of uh, Tibetan Buddhism or the Pun religion has really, really helped uh, people in terms of environment conservation. And much of the mining protests that we see in Tibet right now is because uh, people notice that government is doing uh, mining on the sacred mountain or, or the mining has uh, impacted on the sacred river. And so thus then, uh, because you are so, uh, how do I say, the, the sacred mountain or sacred river, we also believe on deity, the mountain deities uh, at, the, at the same time, right? So it's more about, uh, you know, uh, your, the mountain, seeing, seeing it as, uh, you know, the real God or the deities. And we believe that. And if you, uh, you know, throw any garbage. But nowadays, it's difficult. But earlier time, when I was in childhood, you know, we used to say that it's better not to make too much noise because you are, uh, you know, creating noise pollution at the sacred uh, uh, the deity, you know, on the mountain gets angry. I, I, I remember, still remember that this story that, you know, being a young, young kid, people said that they used to tell a story that, you know, some person disappeared because he was creating lots of noise on this area. And I really, really used to believe that. And then that really, in a way, you know, in a way, you know, uh, helped me in a, um, helped me in a, in a, you know, not making too much noise on the, uh, the mountain mountain area, and but it's it's funny nowadays. You know when people go on high high uh, mountain, they they carry a huge sound box and then you know play play loud loud music, and so it's a very very different uh, different uh, tradition. But then I think uh, Buddhism has really really helped in terms of environment protection. But my Another criticism is that when a state does state is not able to reach on the very remote areas for uh, like national disaster management, then uh, in certain uh, ways, um, you know, creating a stupa or uh, doing some mantra becomes the only solution when you have a national disaster. Uh, uh, so people, I, I see lots of, especially when I went to Tuting, I see lots of uh, small stupas or, or you know, small, uh, you know, lots of prayer flags. And I say, why? Because they said that last year we had a landslide and then our Rinpoche uh, Lama came and he built that. And so, and then now we don't have any kind of, so, so that I think, I think that, uh, you know, it has to go balance both traditional understanding and then the, uh, you know, the modern scientific uh, protection of the environment, I, I feel that both of them should be there. Sorry, my, my answer becomes too yeah, long. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, if I could ask a really, do, do, are there a lot of wells? Do people drill wells for water? 
I don't remember well. Uh, now, earlier, you know, in 1980s or 90s, I remember we using wells. Now, in a, in a rural area, uh, they are tap tap waters. Uh, uh, but then, uh, as similar as I heard that Colorado has lots of hot springs. Uh, in in my uh, village, we also have lots and lots of hot spring. Uh, but then, uh, as I, that that's what I said that in in one way. My understanding is, in one way, we we invest uh, we invest a lot in terms of infrastructure development. Everywhere you you see an aeroplane or or a train, but then um, in my village right now, people still don't have uh, how do we say um, um, bathrooms. So people take bath uh, only when they go to hot springs. Uh, because in, uh, we say that uh, Tibet is very cold weather and we don't have to take bath as uh, you know, much as, as compared to the other area. But now, you know, the temperature, summer has become very hot. People's food habit has, uh, has changed as, at the same time. But so in this case, I feel that, you know, it's the role of the state government to come and create a healthcare facilities and provide proper, you know, uh, washrooms or toilets or, but that's, uh, so I had a really, really difficult time when I went to, went to and uh, it's, it's so, and uh, it's sad because like, since there is no proper bathroom in my village, so I feel, uh, you know, bad also asking my brother to, you know, every time to bring, take me to a, a fancy town to, because I just want to take bath. So uh, I had, uh, how would I say it? It's, it's a very different experience at the same time. Uh, thank you, Lobsang, for an uh, <coughs> interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Peter van Overland. I'm the director of the International GeoX Project Office, as well as a uh, professor at uh, George Mason University. Um, it's easy to become overwhelmed with water challenges, and I think your presentation really highlighted that. So I'm just going to focus on one thing. Um, <clears throat> as you really clearly advocated against dams and that sort of thing, uh, at the same time, uh, as you point out, you know, we want to have more water infrastructure. Hence, uh, also in a given climate, you know, natural water stores are decreasing. So how do you see that contradiction evolve in this region, right? I mean, here in Colorado, we have similar problems, or in the, in the West. Uh, how do we treat the water stores, uh, natural versus uh, human-made? And how do you... How do you see that evolve? Because um, you know, whatever we do, even if we try to come up with environmental solutions, uh, we're going to impact the environment. Um, so, inclusion is one aspect of that. But is there any idea of how to approach that? Hmm. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I hope. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but it's, I know I, it's, it's just. Um, let me let me simplify it a little bit. Um, yeah. So, so narrow it down to a village, you know, in, in Tibet. Um, um, given that you want to have, you know, infrastructure for health and water, clean water, um, under climate change, you know, snow melt is going to uh, become more erratic. Uh, mm. So how, what type of solutions do you, do you see at that scale? Yeah, I think maybe uh, uh, investing in solar or wind, wind energy. Uh, uh, that that could, because I think uh, why I am against of so much of massive infrastructure development or or dam uh, building specifically in Tibet is that um, when it comes to the Brahmaputra building dam construction on the whole Tibetan uh, uh, area, especially um, you know the Nyitsi province of Tibet, there are very few people living on Tibetan local people living on these areas. Then the question is, why do we need so much dam? So that these dams are not for the local people. They are enough, for, I think, if you have a small dam, that could be also, you know, would be enough for the locals who live in that. But then, you know, they build lots of dams to, you know, um, uh, to transfer the electricity to someone far away. And, but then because of the dams, there is a possibility that it could have, the local people are forced to remove from that area and then settle, reset it in some way because that dam would be used for some for someone else. So my understanding, I don't have a very scientific uh, and, uh, uh, like, uh, solution for that, but then I feel that whatever economic development that you bring, 
pay equal importance to the nature and equal importance to the human being who live in that area, uh, right? And uh, in, in some of the Tibetan areas, uh, 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 one of Tibet scholar, uh, uh, before uh, 2008, uh, 2008, there has been a major protest in Tibet and that has really impact uh, for the uh, 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 scholars from outside Tibet to go uh, and have access uh, in, in, inside Tibet. And he said that when he went, so they, we see uh, at one area you see uh, hydroelectric power, but then just next to that, uh, there are local people settled and, uh, and there is no electricity in that village. Uh, so my understanding is that um, nature, uh, whole ecology and human, so whatever you, you try to bring policy, uh, it has to benefit all three of these. You can't remove people in the name of uh, environment conservation. My, uh, my one example is the nomad relocation in Tibet. The forceful nomad relocation is a major, major problem. And nowadays, we, we focus a lot in terms of climate uh, adaptation and mitigation. Uh, according to the Chinese government, uh, forceful nomad relocation from the grassland to an uh, artificial city is the climate change adaptation measure because they believe that overgrazing or the nomads are the causes of grassland degradation on the Tibetan plateau. So that means they don't care about the people. It's just that, you know. So I think, I feel whatever solution that uh, you want to bring, think of a nature. And uh, Tibetan nomads have been on the grassland for thousands of years, and their traditional knowledge and their traditional, uh, you know, belief system, you know, has been able to, exists, uh, you know, uh, in, in a really uh, ecological way in terms of protecting. But right now, the solution is remove the people from that and then let them settle in a fancy, uh, uh, not, I mean, artificial, uh, small village, and then government comes. And then I feel that both the human and the nature has to be given equal importance. And that's uh, sometimes what I feel is is missing in, in terms of environment protection in Tibet. Yes, there are really many, I mean, good policies that has that the government has adopted in terms of <clears throat> in terms of uh, effore afforestation. And local people are, uh, uh, government also encouraged lots of afforestation pro projects on the grassland degradation areas, uh, areas as well. Uh, but then um, another another example is the the concept of nature reserve and national parks. China promotes, if, if you go to one of the website of the Chinese government of uh, in Tibet Autonomous Region, you will say that Tibet Autonomous Region has uh, 47 national parks or nature reserves. And UNESCO go over there and say that, oh, it's a you know, UNESCO heritage. Uh, but the real issue is that what happens to the people in that area? People are removed. Their voices doesn't matter. People don't, uh, and then in the in the concept of modern, I feel that you, know, you can't copy everything from the Western understanding of environment protection. Some people, they think, oh, national parks and nature reserves are really good. But that is not the same thing that is happening in Tibet. Because they want to project Tibet as a very beautiful land. land. The whole beautific uh, beautification project, where this land is to be consumed by the tourists from Westerners, right? And then they come and they really enjoy, but they, people don't ask, what happens to the people who live in these areas? Their livelihood has had, has had a lot of impact. Thank yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we're almost out of time. We have one more question here in the room. Um, I just wanted to say though, um, so before Lulin asks his question, um, you will be available, as we said at the beginning, uh, for further discussion after this. So, so this will be the last question of the seminar part, but everyone is invited to stick around and talk some more with you, and we'll have lunch at around noon in the cafeteria if you'd like to join us. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. And as a native Chinese, I grew up in the uh, China environment in the past and also stayed in the state for almost 20 years kind of uh, have the both kind of a size of the culture kind of in my blood. Mm -hmm. And I am not here defending any uh, Chinese government's policy, but as a very big country and diversity of cultures, land, resources, and so many populations, 
how to best kind of uh, benefit the most people is always kind of the strategy and the goal of the government. So that's why when you are minority and you have the kind of the, the land have the resources that can supply the majority of the population, maybe a sacrifice of some uh, minorities population is, uh, is the way to kind of uh, uh, moving forward. But with the development of the entire country and society, as you just pointed out, there are some uh, useful and helpful policies are made and try to really help the, uh, the entire kind of society as more equity kind of in mind. But I understand for this area that when the nature kind of a natural uh, evol evolution and, and climate change happening and the human activity that impact your lives, that's so hard to to distangle and to kind of a make a coherent picture. So actually, Peter and you actually, when you answer Peter's question, already addressed some of my question. But I just want to really want to saying that how in your mind uh, uh, which which factor is more urgent or or impact the local people uh, kind of a more degree in terms of a, a severity like natural evolution or the climate change impact or the uh, like a mining and man-made kind of activity? That's one kind of question. And the following up is how do you think of a way to, to really voice and then make, make this kind of a whole picture um, uh, to more communities educationalize and make a possible decision or, or solution to resolve most of these uh, impressive kind of the, uh, issues. So yeah. that's that's not a question, more a comment. I, I, I know, I know. I think uh, uh, for me, the, the more, most difficult part, since I said earlier, I'm not from a science, science background. My my background is humanity uh, and, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, I, I would like to go a little bit of a, uh, uh, have some, include some answer in terms of political uh, uh, answer. And in, in, uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, the scientists would not mind that. Uh, but I would like to also uh, emphasize by saying that uh, being a Tibetan born in Tibet and then have to be in exile. Uh, so for the Tibetan, uh, for us, uh, we feel uh, that um, it's the Chinese illegal occupation of Tibet. And uh, so it's not only the climate change or environment problems that we are fighting right now. It's the, the, the whole, uh, you know, the colonialism is the, also another factor that why is these kind of policies are, you know, in, in Tibet. Uh, so that's uh, um, uh, is the, my, my background. And the second, second is that it's also important to understand the, the colonial policies of, of the government. And, uh, uh, I wish I, 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 I wish uh, the Tibetans can be a little more compassionate and thinking that you know oh we have a lots of natural resources and then the let let me help uh, a bit of to the provide a bit to the Chinese uh, uh, population at, at, at the same time uh, but I feel that uh, right now the most of the policies are for the Chinese uh, people. It's not for the local people who live in, 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 in Tibet. And yes, I mean, Tibet has a huge national resources and huge land. And uh, in, in, in Tibet autonomous region, uh, suppose in, in Hasa, we have more Chinese uh, uh, economy migrant than the Tibetans who, who, who live over there. But they are also, I think, uh, in terms of environment, I would like to say that you know, the, there is a possibility. One solution is that, as I mentioned earlier, waste management is one one major problem right now, and which I feel that the Chinese environment NGOs can do a lot. Uh, from uh, you know, they have our resources and they have our human skill. So maybe they can go to Tibet, uh, Tibet's uh, villages, and then help in terms of environment. Uh, um, uh, you know. Um, environment protection on the village village area as at the same time but then uh, yes i mean sometimes we have to be kind uh, but then um, what i what i what i see is that uh, yes i mean but then you know the kind of policies that we witness in tibet is um, to to extract uh, as much as possible to exploit the whole natural resources 
uh, and then get a benefit. But then, as I said earlier, uh, one, I, I really wish that local Tibetans are, their voices really matter, right? It's their land. They have been living in this land for thousands of years, right? The some from outside can't come and, you know, dictate you know, know what is good for you, and so this uh, the 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 classic example is nomad relocation and the mining mining's that uh, we face. But I think right now, if there is a possibility of balancing both, uh, you know, the the human benefit and then conserving the environment at the same time. Tibet's uh, ecology is very, very sensitive right now. It's very, very fragile, and if you keep destroying, then you know, to uh, how do we say restore? You know, it will have a, uh, it will take lots of time, and so it's not only the Tibetans or the Chinese who will have face a negative impact. You might also aware of the uh, the condition of the Yangtze and Yellow Yellow River, right? It's so. A drying and a problem, but then it's not only the Tibetans and the Chinese, but 1.3 billion Asian populations, people from India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Katma, you know, Pakistan, they will also have a huge, huge impact on in that. So maybe I could say that, uh, I don't know, the, the fancy word called sustainable development, if the state, if they really wants to uh, practice that one. And then in appreciating the nature and ecosystem and uh, 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 <laughs> yeah yeah I think uh, that that could be and uh, so my uh, I, I I would appreciate if there is a policy that is benefiting both the ecosystem local Tibetans and the Chinese but I would not uh, be happy if there is a policy where you know you exploit the nature and then benefits all on or only the non non Tibetans so that I feel is like not 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 fair and not kind uh, for the nature. <laughs> I hope I, I answered your your question. Thank you so much. Um, so um, let's thank our speaker one more time. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you so much for coming all this way. And um, you know, I, I appreciate the question and the response, and I think. Um, some of my elder colleagues in the indigenous world of rising voices will say, you know, we should create a brave space. And I think um, maybe proudly we can say that NCAR here is a brave space and a safe space to have these kinds of conversations. And it's the only way we're actually going to um, make any progress on any of these issues is if we can come together. So anyways, with that, I think we need to wrap up. Um, and again, Lob Song will be around for a little while, so please feel free to stay and chat or join us in a little bit for lunch. Thank you.